Welcome to First Star Logistics in the Trenches with Dave Lapham, and special guest today is special, no question about it, Boomer Esiason. Very few people in the world can be identified by one word. When you say Boomer, everybody knows, talking about Boomer Esiason. Uh, welcome to the show, my man. Uh, in the Trenches, I like the name of the show. Like uh, the fact that it's Boomer and people in Cincinnati probably recognize it as that way. I'm not sure around the world they feel that way, but uh, <laughs> we'll say around the Beltway they feel that way. Around the Beltway, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Boomer, um, when you were a kid growing up, did you ever think that your life would be the way it is, the, the, the path that you took playing football into the broadcast world, the whole nine yards? Did you ever think in your wildest dreams – that Boomer Sison's life would unfold the way it has? No, not not at all. I would hope, you know, I remember hoping that I was going to be a professional athlete. I think I would, thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. Uh, I loved the game of baseball, and that was the first organized activity that I ever did, and that was uh, when I was nine years old. So I couldn't wait uh, to play, and um, I loved every minute of it. And basically then it morphed into playing basketball, and then also then came football after that. Uh, football was not my first love, but I always thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. My dad used to take me to New York Mets games uh, on Long Island um, when he would come home from work. And, you know, given the way my childhood was and the way I grew up, um, there wasn't really a lot of, uh, I guess, hope for the future simply because, you know, I lost my mother when I was seven years old. Right. I had two older sisters that had moved out of the house by the time I was 12. And, uh, and really it was, uh, you know, I had my dad, I had my grandfather who was my father's dad living in the house, but he was ailing and he was, uh, from Norway and didn't really understand exactly what was happening <laughs> so all the time. So, uh, you know, kind of the fact that I was able to stay out of trouble and, and actually get a football scholarship is somewhat of a miracle. Pitcher, right? I mean, you, you brought it, I'm sure. What was your fastball? I mean, I, I know you were drafted, weren't you? Well, I, no, I was never drafted. Um, I actually had the Seattle um, Seattle Mariners. Uh, I guess the area scout was in my kitchen trying to convince me okay. uh, that uh, that they would draft me if I would forget football. Um, and that was it. So what basically, Dave, what ended up happening for me is like in high school, I, I started two years as a starting quarterback. We didn't throw a lot back in the uh, late 70s because that's when I was there, 78 and 79, 76. Seven and seventy-eight. Uh, we didn't throw a lot in high school, so I think I threw like eight or nine times a game. Wow. I was on a good team. We won a county championship my senior year. For some reason, I was voted All State quarterback in New York. I'm not really sure why to this day <laughs> when I look back on it. Um, but it was interesting. I think my my high school coach really advocated for me. Uh, he was like a second father uh, to me. You know that uh, basically tried to keep me in line as best I could. He was also my baseball coach as well. And I remember him advocating for the University of Maryland to give me a football scholarship before my senior baseball season started. So I, I had no visits. I didn't go anywhere uh, to college to look to play football. You know, I had some nice letters from Wake Forest and Boston College, but those letters uh, were far and few between, and they never manifested into anything. And because of the connection at the University of Maryland, uh, my high school coach was able to convince them to offer me a scholarship. And I was one of the last scholarships uh, of the 79 class that was the incoming class there. And when I got to the University of Maryland, I think I was like 10th or 11th string on the depth chart, believe it or not. Wow. So um, there were a lot of hurdles to climb to get where I got to. And there was a lot of things in the way. Um, and one of the biggest things in my, in my way was me. <laughs> so uh, I, had a, I had a lot of growing up to do and I had to do it fast. Yeah, there's there's no question about it. I mean, you, you end up uh, being drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals after your career at uh, at Maryland. And how about the MVP season in 1988, Super Bowl 23 memories? I guess first question is, when did you know that football team was special, Boomer? At what point in the season? Well, I, I kind of knew we were getting special in 85 and 86. Um, I, you could feel it. You could, yeah. you could feel that uh, there was a lot of younger players that were having major impact. You know, for us on offense, I mean, we had we were stocked, we were stocked and loaded. Um, you know, when they made the trade for James Brooks, Anthony Munoz was in his prime, uh, Max Montoya was in his prime. Uh, the growth of Joe Walter, Brian Blados, and Bruce Reimers on the right side of the offensive line, and then of course 
we had Rim and Kaz in the middle there, uh, I knew we were going to be a good team. And we were ascending. There was no question that Sam Weish and his staff and, of course, Paul Brown and Mike Brown and Pete Brown uh, were drafting like like crazy. My, my draft year, like almost all of us made the team. Right. And then after that came like Tim McGee and Eddie Brown and David Fulcher and you know, the, the, you know, the offensive lineman that came in with me with Reimers and uh, I think, I, I think it was Joe Walter and Kaz and they may have, Joe might have come the year later. I'm not sure, but uh, they, they just hit on so many different players. And what people don't realize about that 84 team when I got there was how great the coaching staff was, especially on the offensive side of the ball. You know, I didn't know much about, you know, Dick LeBeau and those guys on defense. Right. You know, I saw them and practiced against them, you know, every year. And I was the, the scout team quarterback for the first year and a half that I was there. So I, I saw what he was doing and I saw how difficult it was to like learn. And I think that kind of stunted my growth uh, initially uh, because I was having such a hard time my rookie year, but man, and then that room was filled with like Collinsworth and Kenny Anderson and Turk Schonert, uh, Pat McAnally, Steve Kreider. I mean, this is like one of the smartest offensive groups of people you could have ever been around when I was a rookie. So I learned a lot just, trying to be a sponge uh, and not be a pain in the ass, but I'm sure I was a pain in the ass to a few people. Uh, and then when I finally took over, I just, it all kind of, you know, clicked to me my second year and I saw a, a team that was building. So I, I felt well before that 88 season, we were a good team. As a matter of fact, I think maybe our 1987 team would have been better than that 88 team had it not been for the NFL player strike, which obviously I was front and center in. Right, which really derailed and torpedoed that whole season. And it was really unfortunate the way that whole thing unfolded. But you live and you learn. And if you have passion about something, you fight for it. And uh, I don't regret anything that I did back then, but uh, it certainly, I think, propelled us in 1988 to, you know, getting back to the Super Bowl and becoming a team again. Uh, Boomer, you were the best leader I've ever seen, honestly, and leader of men. There's no question about it ever. Um, you could rally people to the common cause like I've never seen. I mean, what, what was your definition or what is your definition of a leader? Oh, wow. You know, um, I, I think first and foremost, there has to be a commitment and a dedication uh, that is required and that has to be seen by others. So, you know, I worked so hard to learn Sam Weish and Bruce Coswell's offense. Yep. And Sam kept the – adding more and more and more and more to it. And there were so many code words and no huddle, sugar huddle. And you can only do that if the quarterback knows what the hell you want done and doesn't get overwhelmed by it. And yeah. Sam found out when he went to Tampa that it's not made for everybody because not everybody could handle it. Mm-hmm. And I still say that there's probably about maybe three or four quarterbacks in the history of the league that could handle what Sam and Bruce were doing and do it, you know, within 20 seconds at the line of scrimmage and do it under all the, situational stuff that we had going on and um you know so i think i think dedication and commitment is first and foremost and your teammates have to see that they have to see that you're all in and then comes the sacrifice part of it and the sacrifice part of it is helping your teammates become better and if they're better you're going to be better and showing a commitment to your teammates that you really do care about them and you know and i loved all the guys i mean i loved hanging out with the guys and there was nothing better than taking my offensive lineman, you know, uh, sporting clay shooting on Tuesdays or day off or, right. or going to play golf with a bunch of guys yep. and playing skins at Shaker Run Golf Course, you know, <laughs> like in an October uh, when it's 45 degrees out and you're out there with 15, you know, guys, three groups, all playing $20 skins. I mean, just <laughs> it just it, there's nothing better than that. And when you're the so-called leader, the highest paid player, and you're in the middle of all of that, I think that, that the other guys appreciate that. And then, you know, then it comes to the off season, Dave, you know, like, a, you know, maybe the fifth wide receiver on his team is having a football camp in his town in, uh, you know, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, where there's a population of about, you know, 500 people. And he asks you to come down there and go to, you know, his football camp yeah. and you show up and, and you tell everybody in that kid's hometown how great he is and how much he loves where he's from and how much you love playing with him. And, you know, that, that's just, I don't, I don't even say that sacrifice because you learn so much about people and you learn where people come from, which I believe is a big portion of earning the respect of the people that you play with. So there's really no secret to it. It just has to be 
you know, it just has to be a commitment, a dedication, and then a sacrifice. And then the people that you play with or the people that you're asking to join a particular fight like cystic fibrosis, they see that you're all in and then, then it becomes infectious. And then they want to believe that you, you're going to win and that you're going to be a part of something special. Let's talk about that a little bit. You hit on cystic fibrosis. I mean, as a dad, every dad out there admires what you've done for your son, Gunner. I mean, the, the rubber meets the road when commitment, I mean, it's just, it's amazing the amount of dollars that you've raised using your platform to do so. What, what, what kind of numbers is Boomer and, and how proud are you and how, how, what's your relationship like with Gunner these days? It has to be a bond that's just unbelievably unbreakable. Yeah, well, you know, it's like every parent with their child. It's just that our our son has, you know, a disease that unfortunately uh, has affected his entire life. But I, I'll say this, Dave. Um, you know, I got involved with CF Research well before Gunnar was born. Hmm. And it was after the 88 season, I was receiving an award from the Washington Touchdown Club as the NFL Player of the Year, the coach or, or uh, quarterback of the year. And at this dinner, uh, Cheryl and I were sitting there, and Frank DeFord got up and spoke. And I knew who Frank was, but I didn't really know his story. I knew he was a sports writer, right. but I didn't really know personally what he was doing. And before I got my award, he spoke at this dinner, and he spoke about losing his daughter, Alex, to the disease of cystic fibrosis. And I had never heard of that before. Mm-hmm. And I was so inspired by his story that after his, um, after his speech and after I got my award, I went up to him and I said, Frank, you know, how can I help you? What can I do? Uh, I've never heard of this disease and your story has just touched me and my wife. And we didn't have any kids at the time because it was uh, 1980. It was a March of 89, I believe. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Frank said, well, you can go back and you can become the face of CF if you could in Cincinnati, host a golf tournament, maybe a celebrity waiters luncheon at the waterfront, things of that nature. So I got involved in all of those things, yep. you know, and I, and I was, so I was very familiar with cystic fibrosis and this is like the oddity of all of this and maybe the destiny even, I, I, I don't know. So, um, you know, Gunnar was born in 1991. Uh, he is not diagnosed at birth. Um, and then I get traded to the Jets in 1993. Now, 1992 was a really bad year for the Bengals. That was the year that they drafted David Klingler number one, but that was also the year that David Shula took over right. for Sam Weish. And I immediately after Sam Weish was fired, because I didn't know who Mike was going to hire. I immediately called Mike and I said, I want to get traded out of Cincinnati. I don't want to rebuild with a new young coach and all this other stuff. And he said, well, you know, let, let me sift through all of this. I, it's most likely we're not going to trade you, but we're going to need you to be here. So 1992 is when Gunner is really struggling, by the way, yeah. <clears throat> and nobody really knew, knew this. And, you know, obviously we're living with it. And my daughter, Sydney, was born in 92 as well. So we have a newborn and we have a two-year-old that's struggling, wow. essentially a two-year-old that's really struggling. And 92 is the year that we have a new coach. It's David Shula. So they named David off the staff. And at least we had the same offense. And what, what people don't realize is that <laughs> – that first meeting with David about going into the season, he said, no, I'm going to let you call the plays. I'm going to let you do this. I'm going to let you do that. So David was very nice to me and very supportive of me as a player, but we also drafted David Klingler. So I, the first two or three games of the year, you know, I'm, I'm calling all the plays. I'm calling the formations. I'm calling all the personnel groups from the middle of the field and still trying to play. So I'm trying to do all of this. Right. And, and you're um, your own coordinator. We, Right. Essentially, you know, um, but, you know, we had familiarity. I knew the offense. Yep. Um, but what people don't realize is like how hard it is for a quarterback to run an offense in today's day and age. And this is even back in the, you know, the, the, the 90s, the early 90s, you know, with all the formation, all the personnel groups, all the rulings, all the different defenses you're seeing, all the tendencies that you have to try to remember, you know, when you're on the field as opposed to sitting up in the coach's box with all the notes in front of you, you know? So this yeah. is like, I'm trying to do this by hook, by crook. And, and, you know, we, 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 I think we started that year. I want to say two and oh, and then our third game, I believe was in green Bay. And this is when we first find out who Brett Favre is. <laughs> and right. Brett Favre comes off the bench because Don McCaskey gets hurt and he beats us at the end of the game. Yep. Okay. The next game, I think we're at home against uh, Minnesota. And I believe I throw four interceptions in that game. And this game, Cheryl brings Gunner to the game. Huh. 
And I remember sitting in the car after the game and getting food off the field by our fans. I remember sitting in the car and telling Cheryl, I was like, man, man I, I think I got to retire. I don't know if I could take this. I mean, the stress and the anxiety and the weight of what we did at this point, we did not know what was wrong with Gunnar. We just knew that he was struggling and we kept having doctor's appointments and he's staying up through the night and Sydney's born and, uh, and I'm trying to run an offense with a new head coach and, and I'm trying to call the plays. And I finally went in. I, I believe it was after that Minnesota Vikings. I think it was the Minnesota Vikings went in. I said, I can't, I can't call the plays anymore. I just can't do this guys. You know, now meanwhile, I'm not telling them what's going on at home. Sure. You don't want to keep that private. And um, so there was a lot of stress in that 92 season. And that's, that's why the, that's why I reacted the way I did after that season was over and I got traded to the Jets like I was relieved. Like I was finally going back to Bruce Coslett, who now I know will call the plays that will accentuate who I am. And I don't have this pressure on me being a leader, being a mentor, being a father, and all this other crap that's going on in my life. And, uh, and, and it wasn't until the first mini camp in 93 um, for the Jets where I was called off the field by Bruce's secretary, and she said to me, uh, Cheryl's on the phone back in Cincinnati. She needs to talk to you. And that's when Cheryl told me that Gunnar was at Cincinnati Children's Hospital He's hooked up to an oxygen oxygen machine. He had a problem last night breathing. Oh, you need to come back. Right. So that's when I went back to uh, Cincinnati in 1993 and found out that Gunnar was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And that's when I now think back to Frank DeFord's speech, everything that I had done in between this time and that time for CF over the years. You know, I brought the offensive lineman to the CF ward at Cincinnati Children's and all that other stuff. Brian Blados, Blados you know, dressing up as uh, Santa Claus is right. hilarious. Right. It was just great because Blades was the perfect guy to be the, the Santa Claus, and he loved it, and he embraced it. Yeah. And all those guys would come with me to see all those CF patients that, at that time, Dave, I must have met four or five different patients that ended up dying, mm. at, you know, before the age of 10 mm. uh, to CF. That, that's where they were. Now, I didn't know about any of that um, with Gunner until Gunner was diagnosed a year later or two years later. And then all that stuff comes rushing back in your head that now maybe I really do have to retire. Um, and uh, so I, I just, when I think of CF, I think I was born to do this. I think it was a destin, destiny thing for Gunner. I called my dad first, told him, and my second phone call was to Frank DeFord. Frank had about a 30 to 45 second pause on the other end of the phone said, Oh my God, Boomer, this is a sign. There's a reason because we've never had anybody with your sort of um, national spotlight to be able to bring awareness to this disease. And you have to accept this much like we and our family have accepted. And uh, all I could think about was his daughter dying at the age of six and my son sitting there all hooked up to these tubes and oxygen at the age of two and saying, am I going to lose him in four years? Man. And uh, that was uh, the impetus of our foundation and $200 million later. And Gunner's 29 years old right now. He's at the Tuck School of Business at uh, Dartmouth University. That's awesome. And he, and, and he is living a new life because of all the drugs that have come from the test tube to the patient, especially one in the last three years that has basically given cystic fibrosis patients and their families hope for a much, much longer life than they've experienced beforehand. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Opportunity knocking. Boy, two hundred million dollars, and then everything that you've done, like you said, uh, all the events and uh, all the goodwill. I mean, it's 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 just incredible. I I I can't uh, I I I can't put into words the admiration uh, for you as a father doing what you've done for your son and for the cause of cystic fibrosis. It's just uh, it's staggering. It's amazing. You, you know when you when you feel like when you feel like you're set, you're selected though, Dave. Yeah, like I was. Like I there's there's a reason why I met Frank the Ford. Right. Sports Illustrated, by the way, great, great writer for Sports Illustrated, right? Right, and there was, and there was, there was a reason why you know I was exposed to his story, 
yep. well before Gunner was even born. Yep. And uh, it wasn't until four years later that Gunner was diagnosed. And you could imagine my my initial feelings and my conversation initially with Frank DeFord when I told him that Gunner had CF. That's unreal. It is. And uh, so it, it it was not. It really wasn't hard. And I and I actually felt like you know what. <laughs> I'm not losing him in four years. That's not, this is not happening to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to make sure he got all the right treatment, which he did at Cincinnati Children's Hospital initially for the first couple of years. And then when we finally did move to New York, uh, we are at Columbia Presbyterian in Manhattan. And there was a tremendous uh, center there as well, a uh, pediatric center. And then as Gunner grew older, I started to realize that now all of a sudden patients were living longer because of the breakthroughs at that point in his life, around 10, 11, 12. So we had to do something more for CF adults that we had to readjust our focus. Mm -hmm. And we did that. And uh, we built an adult center here, both in New Jersey and, and uh, Manhattan. Because there was no place for them to go. Amazing. And, uh, and Gunner was the impetus for that. And then came along these new uh, generation of uh, drugs that have basically changed the lives of all CF patients and their family, almost all the lives. About 95% of the kids are benefiting from the, the newest breakthroughs in the last three years. And that's why Gunner's, <laughs> believe it or not, he said, Dad, you've unlocked my future and I'm going for it. And I couldn't be any prouder. That's incredible. That's just, that's, that's what a life changing story that is for sure. You mentioned uh, Sam Weich and, and, you know, one thing about Paul Brown, um, he wanted players that had football aptitude, football IQ, however you want to term it. Sam Weish, when he was a, a player for Paul Brown, Paul Brown admired Sam Weish's playbook, how it was so detailed and how he had the thirst for knowledge in the game of football. So he brings this fertile-minded Sam Weish in as a quarterback. He's got a brilliant football IQ guy and Boomer size in a quarterback. And then Turk Schonert is, is the backup quarterback to you, and you've lost both of those guys in a short time frame. I mean, that's just unbelievable that Sam and Turk are no longer with us. But when you think about the, the dynamic of that threesome, how, how significant was a former quarterback of the mindset and the brains of Sam Weish <laughs> and Boomer Esiason hooking up and the synergy of that? How big was that? Well, you know, first and foremost, you know, Turk went to Stanford. Right, <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, you can't be a dummy and go to Stanford. True. You know, it was like, it was like, like I told you that room when I first stepped into it was unbelievable how bright it was and just how it had to be one of the smartest rooms in the NFL. Right. And then to add Sam and Bruce and Jimmy McNally and Tiger Johnson and Jimmy Anderson as our running back coach, it just was like the perfect storm for a guy like me to, to soak up as much as I possibly could. And um, I said this at Turk's funeral, I, you know, one of the kindest people that I could have ever have met at, and at the right time, because he was a popular backup to Kenny Anderson when I got, into Cincinnati and you know the backup's always more popular than the starter in certain situations sure, sure. and Kenny had to deal with a lot of the same stuff that I deal with or dealt with and you know all quarterbacks deal with it I don't, I don't care who you are Ben Roethlisberger deals with it for God's sake and you know he's got a Hall of Fame career so um, <clears throat> you know I, I said it at Turk's funeral that he was one of the most unselfish and kindest people I knew because he knew I was there to take his job and he had had success as the backup quarterback and good success. And so it, it was great for me to be around him. It was great for me to play golf with him and play cards with him. It was great to, you know, hang out, drink beers with him. We were kind of like, you know, bosom buddies a little bit sure. in, in that regard. And, you know, the interesting thing, people forget he left after I think, I think the 86 season and went to Atlanta for a year. Mm-hmm. And he went away and, uh, you know, went for a starting job and it didn't work out. And I'm, I'm trying to think if it was the, I think it was the 87 season. I think you're right. For the 87 season, um, I'll never forget, we had, I think, Doug Gaynor and uh, Ron Hollis or somebody was like the backup quarterbacks going into the 87 season. Yep, Don Hollis. And Don Hollis, that's right. And so they, they weren't all that. I think it was those two guys. Mm -hmm. Sam and those guys weren't all that high on those two guys being the backups going into the season just in case I got hurt. So the first day after all the cuts were made, I come back and we're getting ready for opening weekend. And in the uh, quarterback room 
at that time is Turk Schoner and Mike Norseth. <laughs> Two guys that were, I think Mike was with Green Bay or yeah, I think it was with Green Bay or Cleveland. And, and Turk was obviously cut by Atlanta. So both of those guys had been cut and the Bengals snatched them off the waiver wire and cut the guys that were behind me all through training camp. Mm-hmm. So, which was really interesting going into the 87 season, which was the strike sh- season. So it was both, it was both Turk and Mike who from 87 and 88 were there with Sam and they were like the buffers between me and Sam. Believe it or not, because after the 87 season, a lot of people thought that Sam and I couldn't coexist. Really? And yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you remember, Dave, you know, when we, right before we went on strike, the second week of the season, we lost to the 49ers on a Hail Mary pass. Yep. Yep. Okay. And that was, that was all game management. That that should have never happened. Shouldn't, they should have never gotten uh, the ball. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Or if they, yeah, we, we could have, we should have taken a, uh, a safety at the end of the game and, and right. time would all ran out and right. we didn't, but right. Sam wanted to do something else and it didn't work out. Right. So as I'm going into the locker room, I thought there was going to be a mutiny. I thought that guys were going to attack Sam <laughs> and, you know, and I kind of walked in there and told everybody to calm down, you know, we're all in this together, blah, 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 you know, trying to keep everybody together and there's a lot of tension and everything. Sam gives a speech, and, and then I think, if I remember correctly, I think Sam did take ownership of it in front of the team, right. which the team appreciated, which is what Sam should have done, and that's how he kind of diffused the the incredible, incredible feeling of losing a game the way that we did. Right Now, that Wednesday is when the players went on strike. And, you know, it was a very, very intense, nasty situation in Cincinnati because I had just signed a new contract before the season, which made me the highest paid player in the league. I was the first player to make over a million dollars in the NFL. How about boom? And I was making a million two going into that season. Strong. And, and I, I think there's two reasons for that. One was because of my play coming out of the 86 season and the 85 season, they saw the trajectory and they wanted to rip up the contract and give me a new contract. And number two, I was the NFLPA representative, representative for our team. Now, it wasn't something that I ran for, Dave. It was something that was given to me. Yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you were the chosen. Players, you were chosen. Right, <laughs> the players knew that they couldn't cut me. So yeah. if we were <laughs> heading into a strike season, they wanted to make sure the guy that was speaking for them wasn't going to get cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's how players think. So I, I took it on begrudgingly, and uh, I did it with Dave Remington. Dave was my assistant. Dave ended up getting cut, by the way, at the end of the 87 season. Went to the Eagles, um, yeah. He went back to the Eagles. But, and then, and doing a large part, it was probably a smart move because Dave and I were so tight that they wanted to rein me back in. And plus, Kaz was going to be a center, and Kaz was really good. Sure. Bruce Kazerski. So they, they, they basically, you know, they, they buttered both sides of the bread, if you will. They got rid of my best friend. And uh, who was more expensive than the guy that they replaced him with? And the guy that they replaced him with was a really good player in his own right. Exactly. Yeah. So it was perfect. So for them, anyway, for the Bengals, anyway, it was right. very difficult for me because I wore Dave's uniform out to practice the day that he was let go. <laughs> I, remember, I remember that. <laughs> I kind of had a habit of doing things that would kind of make Mike uh, Brown a little bit annoyed. Uh, but if you remember, right? So that first week of the strike, I was asked whether or not we were going to practice. And my answer was, well, we don't have any football, so I guess we can't practice. Right. So, of course, the media, as smart as they were, Denny Jansen and the lot, go running to uh, Sam Weiss, and they ask him, are you going to give Boomer footballs <laughs> so they can practice? And Sam Weiss said, why should I give Boomer footballs? He's the highest paid player in the league. He's got enough money. He can go buy football. <laughs> uh, you know, so now it's tit for tat, right? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> And I am so livid that this is what he is saying. (laughs) Given the fact four days earlier, I'm in the locker room trying to keep guys from killing them. (laughs) So this is the way this is going to go into this strike. So now the, obviously the reporters come running back to me. Hey, Sam said, you know, you're making the most money. Why don't you go buy the football? And I said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. I will go buy a football cook sporting goods. I'll go down and go get a football cook sporting goods. And I'm going to hold practice tomorrow at LaSalle High School at 12 o'clock. And right. I want everybody to be there. Yeah. So everybody's like, okay, so what is he going to do? What is he going to do? So I go to cook sporting goods. I buy a football. 
I go to LaSalle High School. Somehow we uh, we commandeered their their practice field to go out and practice, and it was like all dirt and it was just awful. But I told the guys we we're having a meeting and we're going to have practice, and I'm going to bring the uh, the media into the the huddle before the uh, practice starts. So I, I I have a whistle, I have a hat on. Uh, I think Rim has a uh, a clipboard, and he's got a whistle around his neck. I think my hat said coach. I I want to say it said coach on it. I, I felt like I had the guys from Cook Sporting Goods do a coach hat for me. I don't know why. Uh, why I, I think, think that? I think you're right, Boomer. I say I can't remember, but I somewhere along the line I wore a coach hat and had a whistle because <laughs> okay. I was trying to make a point, of course. Sure. So I bring everybody up and I say, guys, you know, tough game against the 49ers on Sunday. It's a game that I I believe, and I know you all believe. And again, I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what I said. This could be a little bit embellished, but it sounds fun anyway. Yeah. I said, guys, uh, this is a game we should have won. And uh, I just want you to know that I went and bought the football because according to our head coach, I'm the richest guy in the NFL. Um, so I want to run just one play and I, I want to recreate the end oh. of the game. <laughs> so it's fourth down and there's like 20 seconds to go on the clock or whatever is six seconds to go on the clock or eight seconds to go on the clock, whatever it was. I said, I want the punt team on the field and I want Chris Collinsworth lined up as a punter. And I want to snap the ball to Chris. Chris, I want you to run back towards the end zone. I want you to stay in bounds until the clock hits zero. And then I want you to step out of bounds and we'll give them two points as a safety and we'll walk off the field the winners. Right. I think we ran the play. And if I remember, my teammates picked me up and put them on their, me on their shoulders and carried me off the field. <laughs> <laughs> so I let that speak for itself in reaction to what Sam said to me. So that's why people were wondering whether or not Sam and I could coexist because it really did get intense between the two of us. I'll tell you, you guys, and, man, you guys did though. You guys made beautiful music together after that, boy. Well, you know, you know what was interesting. Um, so the, we go through that year and we lost a bunch of games in the fourth quarter, if I remember correctly, like four or five games in the fourth quarter. You know, we're getting booed. We end up four and eleven that season. Right. Oh, and by the way, the Bengals did an unbelievable thing too. And I got to give them credit for this. This is like one of the all-time great little digs at yours truly. So when I was in college and before I was drafted by the Bengals, they, you know, they have the combines, right? Yeah, sure. And uh, we have our bowl games and all that other stuff. So, um, you know, I made second team All-American. Steve Young was the All-American quarterback, but I made second team All-American. Mm-hmm. I made second team all American, but I didn't even make all ACC. <laughs> the quarterback, that? the quarterback for all ACC was the quarterback from Duke, Ben Bennett. If you remember, I do remember. I don't know if you remember that name. I do remember that. So, name. Yeah. right. So, so I was getting ready to uh, play in the Citrus Bowl against Tennessee, and USA Today had just started, maybe the year before or whatever, and they were covering the Citrus Bowl it was a standalone bowl game. And the reporter was asking me questions about, you know, not being the all ACC quarterback, but being like the second team all American quarterback, you know, how is that possible? And I said, like, I don't know how that's possible because, you know, Ben Bennett at Duke has got to be the most overrated quarterback in the ACC. I said, well, wait a minute, not only the most overrated quarterback in the ACC, the most overrated quarterback in all of college football, let's be real. I said, he may be the most overrated quarterback in the history of college football. Oh, gosh. So the reporter wrote everything verbatim. I got to find that article somewhere. It's out there somewhere. (laughs) So there was this thing between me and Ben Bennett and Gil Brandt, who ran the Seattle Combine, because there were two Combines, one on the West Coast and one in New Orleans. Uh, Gil Brandt, who ran the Seattle (laughs) Combine, we had a dinner the night before and said, uh, we we have uh, Ben Bennett and Boomer Science in here. Something <laughs> like he was making making light of everything that had gone on between the two of us. So fast forward now. This, this is back in 1984. Now fast forward to 87. We're in the middle of the strike. Who the Bengals sign is their their strike quarterback? None other than Ben Bennett. Whose Crazy. locker did they give him? Me. Crazy. What number did they give him? Number seven. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's a tit for tat. I mean, it was full on. And a lot of people didn't realize how full on it was. And that's why it got so intense in Cincinnati and why it was so much fun. I mean, I look back on that. I, you know, I, I kind of think that, you know, we wasted a year of our career. But it's a year that, that the experiences that came along with it and the anxiety and just the intensity of it all 
<laughs> you know, you had we had Tim Crumry cross the line, Reggie Reggie Williams not only crossed the line, but then he got appointed to sitting council for right. God's sake. Right. Right. That's <laughs> like, crazy. I mean you can't you can't make this stuff up, Dave. And <laughs> That's uh crazy. it's uh, and it was all the personalities came together. And the funniest thing about that eighty seven season, I think, to this day is when we all drove back and the strike was over. Like, the, they, they broke us. Let's face it. The, the NFL owners broke us. They were running, you know, scabs out there and, and all these uh, replacement players. And the, and the players caved. Uh, you know, and once Lawrence Taylor and Joe Montana and all those guys started crossing over, you know, all the other guys started getting ner- nervous. And the insecurities started setting in, and everybody wanted to go back to play. So as we drove back into Spinney Field and the replacement players were on the field, I remember walking into the meeting room there with the entire team and Sam Leish and Mike Brown were trying to talk to us. And Mike was saying, okay, guys, you know, it's good to have you back. You're saying all the right things. You know, we want you to go down to Riverfront Stadium and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have practices down there because we're going to have to deal with this here. And uh, we were getting ready to play the Browns that week. And it was a home game, I believe, at Riverfront against the Browns. And Mike Brown delivered the news that the NFL owners were not going to allow the striking players to play that week. That we could practice and they were going to pay us 500 bucks a guy, I think, to practice. But they're not going to allow us to play that the guys out on the practice field were going to play. And with that, I stood up right in the meeting and I said, we're getting the F out of here. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, and you should I, I remember the look on Mike's face and I remember Sam Wash going, <laughs> one of them said, Are you gonna follow him off the Brent Spence Bridge? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Let's go, we're out of here. And uh, yeah, we all left and then we uh, came back that next Monday. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, it was great. Great story. But and then one other story just to finish that off, the eighty seventh season was horrible. And Mike Norseth and, and Turk Schoner. This is why they were so important to our 88 team. Mike Norseth and Turk Schoner convinced Sam that we, me and them, <clears throat> wanted to take him to a comedy club. Um, I forget the comedy club that was in Cincinnati. Uh, that guy, the dork of comedy, remember him? And uh, yeah. Ray Combs, yeah. Ray Combs, Ray Combs and all those yep. guys. Yep. I, I forget what the comedy club was. It was up somewhere in Coleraine, I think. And Sam said, are you guys, are you guys BSing me? Are you really going to take me to a comedy club? And yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to take you to a comedy club. So we pull up to the comedy club and I'm like, where the hell is Sam? <clears throat> and Mike's going, Mike Northup is going, I think he's over there in that Skylark. You remember everybody had a blue Skylark? Yeah. All the coaches had blue Skylark. Yeah. <clears throat> and Sam had a Skylark. And uh, the, the, all the windows were fogged up. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's over there knocks on the window. Sam is in the front seat sleeping. <laughs> Sam, Sam, uh, Sam couldn't get. He, Sam never got any sleep. Uh, and and Mike and Sam had a very very unique relationship. And Mike could always get these weird things out of Sam. And they would talk about marriage. They would talk about everything, everything but football. Right. Right. And uh, I'll never forget, he told, my, Sam told him, he said, look, man, if you're lying to me, I swear to God, I'm going to cut your effing ass tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so we show up and there's Sam in the blue Skylark with the, with the, the steamed up windows. <laughs> so oh, maybe he was man. having sex in the car or something. <laughs> oh, man. And it turned out he was just sleeping in his car because he never got any sleep. He couldn't sleep at night. So we took oh. him to see this comedy club, and Ray Combs was like, "Hey guys, you know it's Boomer and Sam. They're have they're breaking bread together. Well, we need them to come together to have a good year next year, and the whole thing." <laughs> so yeah, man, that, that, that's what led us into the '88 season. We had a great team in '87 and '86. We were growing, but we got kind of derailed with the strike. Unreal. So let's let's fast forward to uh to the current Cincinnati Bengals, Joe Burrow. Zach Taylor, you, you and, and Sam Weiss had a, a unique quarterback head coach uh, relationship. I this uh, here recently during one of your studio shows, I remember you saying to Chris Sims, you know, I know what Bill Parcells meant to you, and you know what Sam Weiss meant to me. What do you think the relationship is uh, looks like down the road here in the future between Zach Taylor and, and Joe Burrow potentially? You know, Dave, I was glad they kept Zach. I was glad they didn't fire him. <clears throat> um, 
you know, it's easier to fire people, and that's not something that the, the Bengals are known for. You know, they they hold on to all of us for as long as they can. Mm-hmm. Um, I think money wise, and also, you know, the reality is that you can't overreact to things that you know just aren't happening fast enough. Um, you know, in two losing seasons, um, you know, you know, Zach is not the the most dynamic of guys when you know he's standing up in front of the team or the camera and all that other stuff. So it's easy for people outside of Cincinnati to say, you got to get rid of this guy and all this other stuff. I'm not one of those guys. I understand what the coach in Cincinnati goes through. I've seen it. You know, Bruce Cosett went through it. Dick LeBeau went through it. Sam Weish went through it. Marvin Lewis lasted 15 years there, and, and he was the magician. You know, and I understand that there are not all the same amount of resources there in Cincinnati that there are in other places. That's why I was glad to see that they kept Zach, and they want to give him another year, maybe another two years uh, with Joe Burrow. By the way, Joe Burrow would have been the rookie of the year yep. had he not gotten hurt. Yep. He was on his way. Yep. And so what I saw uh, was a mature young man who came out of LSU who had all the intangibles uh, to be a great quarterback. And one of those things that I always want to see in a quarterback is, is he an athlete in another sport? And if he is an athlete in another sport, what kind of athlete is he? Yep. So knowing that Joe is a, um, a, a point guard and an all-state point guard in the great state of Ohio, uh, I knew that he had what it took to be a great football player, and he was dedicated. And he's a much more mature guy than I ever was when I came out. I was a maniac. You know, this kid is polished. <laughs> this kid is refined. Uh, and Sam was a maniac. So you had two maniacs coming together, and somehow we found harmony with one another. Uh, that's not these two guys. These two guys are not like me and Sam, combustible and crazy and flamboyant and all that other stuff. These are legitimate guys that I think showed in the brief period of time that they were together that they can have an explosive offense together. And I, and I suspect that they will when Joe does come back, whenever he does come back. Yeah. Um, so I was glad to see that Zach was staying. And, and, I, and I think it's good for the future of the Bengals. And, you know, they've had some really good drafts. They get some really good young players on this team. Um, and it reminds me a little bit about, like, when I got there, I saw the young players. I saw the wave of guys come in. And when you see it and then you watch it on the field, uh, you say to yourself, this is going to be a good team if somebody will just have the patience to allow it to grow. And, and, and the guy that has the patience and, and has always had the patience will be Mike Brown. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And Joe Barr, you look at it, Boomer, uh, his first training camp eliminated because of the coronavirus, second training camp potentially um, minimized because of an ACL reconstruction. How difficult is that, you know, the first two years in the league, not having you know, OTAs, mini camps, all those kind of things that can prepare you for the regular season? You know, Dave, after my rookie year, if there were social media, there was no way the Bengals would be able to keep me. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, the Bengals um, – could have easily gotten rid of me my rookie year. I was so in over my head. I had no idea what I was doing, trying to figure out Sam's playbook and all that other stuff. That's why it's amazing to me when you watch guys like Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert and now, you know, all these young kids that come right in and play right away. Right. And the thing about Justin and, and Joe this this particular year is that it looked like they were still playing in college. Yeah. That's how both that's how good both of them looked and how prepared they were. And, and remember, both of them pretty much went through an entire college career. In other words, they, they stayed in college. They weren't you know, you know two years and done like Sam Darnold was. That's why Sam Darnold, I think, just, you know, really struggled in New York. It's not just because of the inconsistencies with the decision-making above at the administrative level for the Jets, but it's also the immaturity of the young man that they're asking to take on the load to be an NFL quarterback as opposed to Justin and Joe, who were older and more polished when they got into the league and more mature. So um, I, I think the world of Joe Burrow, I think he's a terrific young man. I know that he'll put every ounce of effort into his, uh, into his rehab to bring him back to be the player that, you know, we started to see unfold here for Cincinnati. But you know, he already, he's already had 400 pass attempts, I believe, already uh, in his young career. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know when he'll be back. Um, I, just, I just hope that everything is going to be right for him. And what I love – more than anything, is just how he is reacting to all of this. He's not blaming anybody. He's not blaming the coaching staff. He's not blaming his teammates. Um, he's just worried about him getting better and leading this team back to the playoffs. And I think he's the right personality to do that. Boomer, I, over the years, have you, did you ever give any consideration to coaching, front office positions, ownership potentially? I mean, have you ever thought about any of that stuff? 
No, not really. Um, you know, my, I have a lot of friends that still are coaching. You know, my, my college roommate is the head coach for the Indianapolis Colts. Right. I talked to him a lot right. about the NFL. And, Frank you know, Reich. He kind of, yeah, Frank Reich. He kind of fell into that uh, because Josh McDaniels backed out about three years ago. But there's a lot of headache and heartache when you're in coaching. You know, he, he started in Indianapolis as the quarterback coach uh, for Peyton Manning. And I, I remember calling him and saying, you know, Bill, Bill Poley and the former GM of the Buffalo Bills, where he played as the backup behind Jim Kelly, hired him in Indianapolis and made him the quarterback coach to Peyton Manning. I said, man, you got the greatest job in the world. He goes, man, damn, that's the hardest job in the world. This, this guy is crazy, like in a good way. Like he is so demanding of us as coaches. And that's why watching Peyton go to Denver and win a Super Bowl was so satisfying because he taught the Broncos how to win again. You know, they, they, they never were able to replace John Elway and they still haven't replaced him, but they did for those few years when they brought in Peyton Manning. And that's what Tom Brady's doing with the Bucks. So I, you know, I, I just, I never really thought about it just simply because it's like a nomad's life. It's like they, they work in a place for three years and they got to go find another job somewhere else. Right. And I, I didn't want that. I, especially with a kid with cystic fibrosis, I wanted to make sure that he knew what school he was going to, that he built up a friend with friends and he had the right hospital and the right doctor. So while I probably would have loved to have done it, um, there was just no realistic way for me to do it under those circumstances. Boomer, it certainly sounds like you're still got a lot of passion, you know, almost as a fan of sorts for the Bengals. I mean, guys that played for a football team want to see that football team do well. If the Bengals reached out to you and said, you can change one thing, Boomer. What would that one thing maybe be? Well, I mean, I'm not there every day. Um, as far as the resources for the football team are, I, I would hope that they someday would build themselves an indoor facility just so they can keep up with the Joneses, if you will. Right. Um, I would also, I, I know that they did embrace, you know, our anniversary. And unfortunately, I couldn't make it. It was in the middle of the week. Um, and you know, I have a full-time job <laughs> and, uh, sure. it was interesting that when they, they actually honored our Super Bowl team, it was on a Thursday night, which is really, it was disappointing for me because I, I miss all my teammates and coaches and I wanted to be there for them. Uh, fortunately enough, I was able to come back for a different anniversary on a Monday night game when I was broadcasting for Westwood one. Uh, so that was nice, but you know, it's the only team, honestly, Dave, that doesn't have a ring of honor in their stadium. Right. And for all those years that I did Monday night football, 18, uh, I would go to these stadiums on Monday night and they would always honor their players of yesteryear. Um, and I think what by honoring those players and remembering who they were brings a father and a son together, mm -hmm. you know, so a father can go to a game today and say, you know, there's Joe Burrow. I'm going to buy you the number nine jo Jersey for Joe Burrow. Right. But you have to know that this was my quarterback meaning Kenny Anderson or me or Carson Palmer or Jeff Blake or uh, anybody else in between. This is the guy that I grew up rooting for. And that's how you link fans together in families. It's through, you know, the discussions over the football, over the table, who's the best quarterback, who's the best team, you know. And the Bengals have a rich history of great players that they've never truly honored. It doesn't show up in the Hall of Fame because we only have one well, two Hall of Famers with Paul Brown, but Paul Brown's in the Hall of Fame for a different reason. It's what he accomplished, I think, in, in Cleveland more so than sure. at, be, being the owner of the Bengals. But, right. uh, you know, Kenny Anderson should be in the Hall of Fame. Kenny Riley should be considered for Hall of Fame. Um, you know, this, I, we can go down a list of all of these guys that should be right. possibly be Hall of Famers that aren't. But that doesn't mean we can't honor our own background and our own players and be proud of what those players have accomplished. I mean, we've had some unbelievable players come through that organization. So right. that to me is, is really what's missing uh, in a big way because it's, it's every team, how even our high school teams <clears throat> honor our memories. And so do, uh, so do our colleges. Uh, and every other pro team has a ring of honor except for the Bengals. They do not have a ring of honor, which is just so bizarre to me and bizarre to everybody else that not now knows about it. Right. Right. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, current day football in terms of playoffs. The final four, the teams that are left, they've got two. You get two games to have veteran quarterbacks, future Hall of Famers, and you got two teams in the AFC that got young bloods, you know, that are that are uh, making their mark in the National Football League. Give me your thoughts on each of these guys. Well, you know, uh, first of all, Tom Brady is the most dedicated, most committed player that I've ever seen in the history of our sport. Um, you know, there are guys like Clay and Bruce Matthews that lasted long times, Brett Favre, 
you know, Brett Favre didn't take care of himself the way that Tom Brady, you know, Brett Favre lived on, you know, a wing and a prayer. Right. Uh, he was always on edge. Um, but Tom Brady takes care of himself physically like no other player that I've ever seen in the history of the league. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it shows itself. And, and, and I have nothing but just the utmost respect for everything he's accomplished. And it kind of shows you <clears throat> just how important he was to Bill Belichick and the 20 years that they spent together in New England. So in my eyes, the greatest quarterback of all time. He may not be the greatest gifted or uh, athletic quarterback or pretty quarterback when it comes to throwing the ball, like right. say a Dan Marino or Joe Namath or you know Roger Staubach or even in today's game, Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes. Yep. But yep. there's never been a guy more dedicated uh, than him. So uh, I, I have nothing but respect for him. Aaron Rodgers, one of the most gifted throwers that we've ever seen in the history of this league. Um, I would put him up there with the top three throwing quarterbacks of all time. And what I mean by throwing quarterbacks, I mean the way they look and how they throw the ball. Agreed. Dan Marino would be one of them. Yep. Quick release, just awesome to watch. Aaron's that way. And I would say Joe Namath mm-hmm. uh, was one of those guys. Just when they picked up the ball and you and you watch how they throw it, it's poetry in motion. Yep. Um, and now they finally found the right coach to re-unlock uh, his potential to where he had the greatest season of his career at the age of 37. And that was the year that I retired, by the way. So he is seeing everything, and he has the ability, and he's got the health uh, to lead his team. And what I love about the Packers, and you would love this too because you're an offensive lineman, you know, they're not just a throwing team. Oh, they yeah. run the ball. Oh, yeah. And they maul people running the ball. And they got three running backs back there that are like Mack trucks that are running through the line. Mm-hmm. And they set the tone last week against the number one defense against the Rams by running it and saying, you know what? Yeah, we got Devontae Adams, and we got – you know, Aaron Rodgers, but you know what? We got these three running backs in this big offensive line and you are not coming in here and out physically us as a team. And that's why I think they'll win this week and they'll beat Tampa because they're much more physical than they were last year when they got pushed around by San Francisco in the NFC championship game. Yeah. On the other side, I don't know what to say about Patrick Mahomes other than um, he's gotten off to the greatest start of any young quarterback in the history of our league. Uh, he has played, I think, in about 43 or 44 games, uh, which is the amount of uh, playoff games that Tom Brady's played in, by the way, (laughs) (laughs) which is unbelievable. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes has never had a bad game, Dave. Never had a bad game. Even in the games they lose, he throws for 350 yards and four touchdowns like it's nothing. Uh, It's crazy. Um, Crazy. It is. So his abilities, and I I believe he will play uh, this week. Uh, He's coming off of a, a concussion that, wasn't really a blow to the head. It was more of a body concussion, nerve type thing. And everything that I hear from Kansas City is that he should be ready to go against Buffalo. Right. And then there's Josh Allen. Uh, I didn't know who Josh Allen was until my son Gunner called me on a Thursday night. He goes, are you watching this Wyoming game? I'm like, no, nah, I'm sorry, God. I'm not watching the Wyoming game. you got to turn it on. So I said, okay, I'll turn it on. So I turned it on, and it was in a snowstorm. And there's a six foot five, two hundred and forty five pound kid running all over the freaking place <laughs> and throwing the ball like seventy yards in the air and I'm like, Holy crap, who is this guy? <laughs> right. And so I watched him the rest of the year. Gunner turned me on to him. Huh. And um so when he was coming out in the draft, I said, I hope that Cleveland would have taken him number one or Buffalo would have taken him and trade up to get him. Well, he fell to Buffalo and Buffalo was lucky. And the reason I said that is because he's from a really small town in California. He went to Wyoming, played in lousy weather, and he just either fits Cleveland or Buffalo. And if you ask him today, he'll tell you that he loved the fact that he's playing in Buffalo, a small town with a rabid fan base, because that's what he has always wanted as a player. And now he has grown into a refined superstar, and he is probably in in the top five right now in the NFL. And hopefully – Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow will follow in his footsteps. And about two years from now, we'll be talking about them the way we're talking about him. Yeah, back, real quick uh, trivia thing on Brady. Uh, Tom Brady has as many wins against NFC opponents in the playoffs as uh, Drew Brees does. He's got six Super Bowl wins and now two playoff wins. He's got eight, <laughs> eight NFC wins the same as Drew Brees. <laughs> he's, only, he's only been in the uh, NFC for one year. It's crazy. You know, those six Super Bowl rings are nuts, man. It's just absolutely if he crazy. Plays, if he plays another two years, which I think he will, assuming he doesn't have any major injury. Right. If he plays another two years, there's a chance. I guess he could get to 48 playoff games. Oh, my god! And 48 playoff games is essentially three extra right. years of football three on seasons. top of playing for 23 seasons. Un- 
unbelievable. It really is. <laughs> if you got time, uh, could you give us a thumbnail sketch on the AFC North quarterbacks? Wow, you know, it's a big question about what's going on in Pittsburgh right now. I know Ben wants to come back and play. He's got a $41 million cap hit if he comes back and plays. Right. They're going to have to do something with his contract. He's only he's only making fourteen million of the forty one. The reason the cap hit is like that is because every year they gave him money, they moved more money down the line. Right. Eventually, it's going to come home to roost at some point. Yep. They could uh, so they're going to have to do something with him. So I, I think I think he's going to play, and um, you know I don't I don't know really how much longer. Maybe this will be it for him. So one more year for him. So I you know he's he's a championship caliber quarterback. And they'll have a chance if he comes back. Uh, Baker Mayfield, um, I'm finally glad that they got the right coach for Mm -hmm. him. You know, that's been a revolving door. And what happened to him in Cleveland is a lot like what happened to Sam Darnold in the Jets. There's no consistency. So how does a kid grow if he doesn't have a quarterback uh, or a, a coach and a system that's in place for the three years that he's there? Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson have had that stability. They have that coach. They have that offense. And that's why those two guys have been so successful. You know, Lamar, I, uh, I think, is a tremendous athlete. They're going to re-up him this year. They're going to extend him, right. which means that, you know, he's going to be around for a while. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sold on the, on the passing attack. Uh, it, you know, he could throw for 250 to 300 yards a game. He's a great athlete. They utilize him in the run game. I know he worked really hard this offseason to get better out of the pocket and not run as much. But, you know, you saw it in a playoff game against Buffalo. There was a little bit of wind. Um, he really struggled in that game. Yep. And it, it's just a reoccurring situation that has happened the last two years now. Um, I think Joe Burrow can be and should be, five years from now, the best quarterback in the division. You're here. We'll be talking about Joe Burrow going to his third or fourth uh, Pro Bowl. That's how good I think he is. And that's how smart I think Duke Tobin is to – surround him with playmakers you know Bengals have plenty of uh skill guys and they'll continue to add around him um they just have to protect him yep and i think he's going to be a great great player so i wouldn't be surprised here if we're sitting here in 2000 you know 24 2025 talking about joe burrow being the best player not only in that division but maybe even in the entire league the trend toward mobility that NFL quarterbacks, I mean, you've got 10 different quarterbacks that rush for at least 300 yards in the regular season. I mean, they're all, they're all, uh, some of it is quarterback design runs. A lot of it is scrambling and all, all that sort of thing, but the quarterback design run part of it, is that dangerous? Is that going to be a dangerous trend? Do you think? Uh, you know, I'm not a big RPO guy. That's the run pass option play that they run a lot of times. Um, you know, the way the, the way the game is supposed to be played is the way that Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady play it. Yeah. Uh, the way that Patrick Mahomes plays it. You know, you run. You see what happened. You saw what happened to Patrick last week, and that wasn't that was a design run. And he took off, and bam, he gets hit. Yeah. I mean, like, those guys get a uh, shot on you, man, they're going to take it because it's it's so far and few between do they have a chance to actually do that. So I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Um, every now and again, it may work, and it may get you a first down if you can get your quarterback to run out of bounds. Um but I, uh, I know it's a part of the game, and I know it's a part of the vernacular in the NFL. But I still believe the way that Joe Burrow plays, the way Justin Herbert plays, uh, the way that um, you know Patrick Mahomes plays, it's out of the pocket. And then if you have to make a play on the run, you're a good enough athlete to do it, and you're smart enough not to take a direct hit. That's why I hate called runs for quarterbacks coming out of the backfield. Boomer Esiason, big market uh, daily radio show, CBS studio work, nonstop fundraising efforts, time management, skills are off the charts, my man. Thanks for carving time to uh, to join us today. I, I don't know how you do it. I don't know if there's enough hours in the day, but Paul Brown would certainly be proud of you because he always said football, pro football is just uh, the beginning phase of your life. You're, you're, you're going to have uh, another life's work, and you've been great as a player and as a broadcaster, too careers that have been great. You, you're you're a, a big example of what Paul Brown's talking about, my man. Well, so are you too, Dave. And, uh, you know, like we live this life. We love the game and we love talking about the game. And uh, I'm blessed to have played the game. And the NFL gave me a platform to do what I'm doing, both uh, behind the mic and then uh, around our fight against cystic fibrosis. So believe me, I'm the lucky one and certainly have never 
uh, taking anything for granted. And that's why you and I do what we do. We love it. And uh, it gives us a great, great platform uh, to be able to do what we want to do. No question, Boomer. My best to your lovely wife, Cheryl, and the kids. And have a great one, sir. Appreciate it, Dave. Thanks so much, man. Have a great year and, and enjoy the games. Enjoy the Super Bowl. You too.